So I'm going to give a tutorial on using Spinnaker. So we have set up this Jupyter notebook, as I said in the introduction. Um, it's on this web server here. So if you go there, you should be able to um, sign in if you had an HBP account already. If you don't have an HBP account, um, you can actually register for a temporary local account. And in that case, you just enter a username and password of your choosing. Um, if it's not been taken, or if the username hasn't been taken already, it will um, let you sign up with that. Basically, um, it asks for your email address, and the idea for that is that <coughs> if you, at the end of this, um, we can email all the people who took part in the session who didn't have an HBP login, and we can offer them an HBP login, basically, uh, and then hopefully you'll be able to access the other HBP stuff as well, um, brain scales included. Um, it, I think it it will try and email you. Um, to do the sign-up process as well to verify your email, but I have a feeling it's not essential that you click on that link. I think it will work as soon as you've done the register, but it'll let me know if things are going wrong. Okay, sorry, does everyone have... Um, Please check your email to complete the registration. It does say that, yes. <laughs> if that works, that's great. If it doesn't, try using the username and password you just entered anyway, and it'll probably just work. <laughs> okay, I'll come back to... Um, yeah. yeah, if you need, there's a different Wi-Fi up there as well if you're not getting the standard guest Wi-Fi. Um, we've been told there's another one. I'm getting the standard guest Wi-Fi, but it seems like it, it stops probably around about here somewhere. <laughs> Sorry? Oh, is there are multiple as well. Yeah, I suspect that's fine. I have no idea, I'm afraid. <laughs> okay, good. Yeah, it's that spin dash 20... Yes, man, but give me a shout if you... Uh, and the login does work fine with the email. I did click the email, but I didn't try it out. So. Okay, fine. <laughs> definitely definitely, definitely works with the email. Well, the email comes through. That's the important bit, yes. yes. Good. <laughs> I have tested it, but you never know with these things. They do change. So, okay, um, when you get onto the system, you'll see it's a Jupyter notebook. Now, if you've not used Jupyter before, um, it looks a little bit like this. Don't worry too much if you haven't got on just now. We can, we'll come back to this later. Um, there are, it basically looks like a folder. There's various um, files and things down here. Um, I'll go on to the next one. There is basically a new button over oh, over on the right. Sorry, you got lost. Right? Sorry. Could you go, back? go back one. Do you mean the that one? Or? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. I'll give you a couple of minutes then. <laughs> if you're taking a photo, that's another way. Yeah. <laughs> Good. Okay. So yeah, when you get onto the system, there is um, this new button over here, and it lets you access the various um, kernels that have been installed in the system. Um, the one I would advise using is called Spinica. That one's got all the software installed in it. There is a Spinica Git, which has the absolute latest code in it, um, which I'm pretty sure works. But just in case it doesn't, you're probably best using the Spinica one, because that's the actual release code. Um, is there anything else on that one? There is a terminal thing down the bottom. You're welcome to play with it. It just gives you a terminal. Um, it's all running on a Docker instance, so anything you do in there won't affect anyone else, so don't worry too much. You shouldn't be able to screw it up. <laughs> if you do, I can delete your Jupyter, and we can start it again, so it's not the end of the world. Um, once you've entered, you get a page that looks like this. This is having opened a Spinica kernel, so you can see it's up in there. Um, and you can enter your code as normal. Um, there's a few things again in here. Again, if you did actually want to switch, if you've written some code in the Spinica and you want to say, hey, I wonder if it works on the Git version to see if it still works with the latest stuff, you can actually switch the kernel. Um, if at any time you're running stuff and it seems to get sort of plunged up and you can't work out what's going wrong, you can always restart clear output, which will just reset the whole kernel so you can start it all again. Um, this does happen with the Spinnaker stuff because there's a certain chain of order that you have to run things in and if you get it out of order it can end up getting a bit messed up so sometimes you might need to do that. Um, what's the other one on that? Yeah, and at the end when you finish with a notebook it's probably a good idea to close and halt because that actually shuts down that kernel for now. It doesn't delete anything but it does shut it down so um, you can obviously save things as well as you go along. It does have an auto-save system I think it's like two minutes or something like that that it saves it actually. Yeah. Possibly the so. useful feature of the thing. Yes. <laughs> Possibly is. Save multiple times. Save know. multiple times. So that's the basics of using the Jupyter system. So I'm kind of going to cover roughly the sort of pine 
um, interface at this point. Before I do, I just wanted to mention this is all about spiking neural networks. So Spinnaker is a spiking neural network system. I don't know, in case people don't know about them, they probably do. Spiking neural networks, basically spikes are occurring across the synapses and the membrane potential is building up in the neuron. And when it reaches a certain threshold, it sends out its own spike and then you build up networks and it resets and then the whole process sort of starts again. So that's sort of the basics of it. Um, there is also um, the synapses themselves are basically a bit more detailed modeling. So there's sort of a movement of charge across the synapses. So when the spike occurs, the charge moves across the synapse and this sort of shows up in the network and it makes it much more nonlinear. Um, and you, you sort of see if a spike occurs and you think, hey, that should be enough charge to make my next neuron spike. It might not happen immediately because it has to send that charge across the, the synapse before it happens. Uh, so what is Pine? Pine is the neural network language we use. The idea of Pine is that you can write a single neural network and run it on lots of different systems. Um, how true this is in practice depends on the implementations, admittedly. Uh, there are definitely different um, parts of Pine that are supported by different systems, more or less. So the stuff I'll talk about today is almost supported across the systems. I expect if you go and see brain scales later on, they'll tell you there's a load of stuff that they don't support because, of course, it's a much more constrained system. They can only support what actually their piece of hardware has. Spinnaker is a general purpose computing system, so we can support much more. But of course, it depends on us software people, like myself, having actually gone and implemented those features. So we haven't implemented everything. The stuff I talk about today, obviously, we will have implemented. Um, but if you, if you go and look up Pine and find something missing and you really want it, then obviously you can ask us and we can try and fit it into our schedule of implementing things. So the first thing you do when you're using Pine is you actually bring in the Spinnaker part of Pine. So you say import pine.spinnaker as p. That actually brings in the Spinnaker system and says I'm using Spinnaker for doing Pine. Simple as that. Um, the next thing you have to do is then call a setup. So you say p.setup. Now p is whatever you want to call it. Call it sim, call it anything. But I've called it p here because p stands for Pine. You often see a lot of Pine example scripts use that. Um, the default setting of Pine, I think, is 0.1 millisecond time steps. Um, that means it won't run in real time on Spinnaker. The default setting for running in real time on Spinnaker is to use one millisecond time steps, because that's what it's designed to do. Um, and when we're using one millisecond time steps, it means the simulation time and the real time will progress at the same rate. <laughs> so 30 milliseconds will happen in 30 milliseconds. Um, if you do, you can use a time step of 0.1 milliseconds. It's absolutely fine. The software will pick this up and say, you're using 0.1 milliseconds, I'm going to run 10 times slower. So everything will then run the sim time. It'll take 30 milliseconds to do 3 milliseconds of simulation. Um, that's just the nature of the system. We have to make sure that things stay in real time. So we, we slow it down a bit. Um, the reason why. Can we check how people are doing with the, with the registration process? Yes, I mean, we'll, we, I'm not going to. When we finish this, people will hopefully have time to do that afterwards. But if people are struggling, then, then they want to actually interact with the system as we go. I have an authorization failure. Oh, really? That's a weird one. <laughs> you might be best to sign up for a local account just to get it to work. <laughs> so that should work. Got the, wait, two stick your email, and yep. email has shown up. So no email showed up. You should be able to just log in log anyway. In. Oh, yeah. Still yeah. yeah, just use the same username and password you entered, and it will work. That's fine. Yeah, you got the first email, and then everyone else it broke. <laughs> yeah. This is definitely a fairly new system I've set up. Hopefully, the, the Jupyter part should be fine, but the authorization is a little bit experimental. So. <laughs> It worked. Excellent. Good. <laughs> okay. As I say, you don't necessarily need to follow this. The idea is at the end, as in literally follow it in code. Hopefully at the end we'll have time to go through the actual, uh, there is some material on the Jupyter notebook so we can log you in. You can actually then follow through some examples and things. So it's not too critical if you haven't managed to log in. Don't worry. Um, so yes, to go back to this, the time steps, why might you want to use a different time step? Well, at one millisecond time step, things are just not as precise. So this is to do with how much time there is between processing um, neuron updates. So you might have a curve like this that comes out at one millisecond time step, and the curve at the bottom would come out at 0.1 millisecond time steps. It's just it, you've got more precision. So there are certain neuron types, neuron models, which will work better at the higher precision. Um, we have neuron models that work fine at one millisecond time step, though. So we often say, just use those if you can. If you're trying to do something specific, of course, you might need to go to 0.1 millisecond time steps. OK, so what can I do with Pine? First thing you do is you create populations. So you've set it up. 
<coughs> we want to now create, describe your neural network. So we describe a neural network here. We say it's a population of four neurons. It has a neural model called IFCUR X, and I'll get into that in a minute. Uh, and you can give them labels if you want. Um, that just helps you identify things later in the script. It's not critical, though. Um, and here's yet another one. I can create another population. This one has two neurons in it. So basically, you're just describing the blobs and the little blobs inside, pretty much. I furiously typing away there. <laughs> I wouldn't, wouldn't guarantee that all these scripts will work. That would be interesting to find out. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think I've copied these out of a, uh, into, a, into a sheet. Yeah, exactly. You'll find out, I suppose. It'll come up with an error somewhere along the line. <coughs> So the options are uh, you're going to fire is in is in Yeah, I'll show you that in a minute. In fact, there we go. We've got these ones. So these are the ones that are implemented. Basically, on the right, I've shown you can just about see on the screen. I've shown some um, voltage traces for a network running with these things, so you can sort of see roughly how they behave. Uh, we have a current-based leaky integrating fire neuron, which is lift cur X, but it's got exponentially decaying synapses. Uh, we've got the conductance version of the same. Uh, and we have the Isakevich neurons. I, the IFCUR exp is the one we tend to use most of the time, um, and it works pretty well in most situations. It's fine at one millisecond time steps. The other ones are less fine at one millisecond time steps. It really depends on what you're doing with them. They certainly show odd behaviors when you start to do fairly complex networks at one millisecond time steps. You get things, conductance is meant to be a physical thing, so when it reaches a certain point, it'll stop stop going, the voltage stops moving. <laughs> the problem is that one millisecond time steps, you tend to overshoot, and so it starts behaving very weird, so you get sort of strange bouncing behavior. It's not much fun. Um, so the other, thought, the other populations you can have, so they're the neuron models, but you also potentially want to stimulate your network with some, some spikes. Um, there is spike source array, which you can then specify specific spike <coughs> times. You can specify that for various neurons. I've actually forgot to put the end neurons in here. I've now spotted. So you do the same sort of thing. You say, ah, okay, no, actually, you wouldn't put it in this bit, of course. You put it in the population. Um, you can describe different spike times for different neurons as well. It doesn't all have to be one spike, one set of spike times for those. Um, the spike source Poisson is just Poisson noise. Um, so you can see it just produces less uniform sort of output. Is there a quick command to plot that? Uh, no, you'd have to run it first. <laughs> this is all run and recorded stuff that I've done. Yeah, We'll get to that by, by the end, definitely. Um, so yeah, in fact, first thing you need to do is record them. So before you, when you're going to record, you can record at least V and spikes from neuron populations. You can record spikes from your input populations. The inputs don't have Vs. V is the membrane potential. So of course, the spike source arrays and spike source buttons don't really have membrane potential. They're just sending out spikes. Um, so when you record V, it'll probably you'll be able to draw a graph a bit like this. When you record spikes, you might draw a, a graph a bit like that. I'll come to the actual plotting later on. Um, yeah. So everything you're everything you're writing is just describing the network. It's not yet reach run. We'll get to that in a minute as well. Um, you can also initialize where the membrane voltage starts. So here we can actually start it at. I think on the. Oops, actually, let me go backwards a bit. Yeah, on that one, I think we started it at minus 65 as the standard. On this one, that's the same run, but with a uh, initialized to minus 60, so you can see it started higher already. Um, and you can, in fact, do random distributions as well. So you can say, uh, I want to start my membrane voltage at various points. Um, and this is a big, big load of them running, so they're all just randomly starting uh, at different times. And they're all being stimulated the same way in this case. Um, you can very, uh, you can get other different distributions. This is just a uniform one, which is probably fairly standard. Yep. Uh, can I have a question? Yep. If for that refractory period, it's a constant. Can uh, you can change it. it. Yep. So all the parameters you can change. Um, I haven't described it here because there's so many parameters. <laughs> <laughs> I think the when at the end I'll show you the thing that you can actually go into to to read even more detail if you want to. <laughs> there's a lot of detail though. Yep. Yep. But yeah, you can change the refractory period, absolutely. It's all software on the machine, so it's down to what we've implemented there, really. Um, yeah. So once you've created your populations, you want to connect them together. You want to describe how they're connected. So you've got a projection to do that. So it's p.projection. You've got your first population, your second population. It's a unidirectional connection. But of course, you can create the opposite direction connection as well. That's fine. You can create multiple, excuse me, multiple projections between the same 
two populations if you want to with different parameters. Um, you, do, you describe it with a connector which describes something I'll come to in a minute and a synapse type which I'll also describe in a minute. <laughs> uh, yep. So uh, at each population you can include uh, multiple uh, neurons? Yes. Or just yes, each population is a group of neurons, normally speaking, generally speaking, and we advise that you do that. Don't just create single neuron populations everywhere if possible. If you can create them as a group, that works better on the machine because the software tends to map a population to a core or to multiple cores. Um, and then when you say uh, weight, it depends on the, the type of connectivity. For instance, yes. This is one to one overall. Yes, you have different okay. things. Yeah, yeah I'll, I'll come up to that in a minute, in fact. Um, the other thing you're allowed to do, of course, is to have a receptor type in this. So you can say, is it excitatory or is it inhibitory? So does it try and, try and make the, the voltage go up or does it try and make the voltage go down, basically? Um, and yeah, the weight describes the, the size of that. So in terms of connectors, this is the actual sub-connectivity between the neurons in the two populations. So those populations I showed you at the start with the two. This one is a one-to-one -one connector. There isn't enough neurons on the left to connect all the ones on the right, so it just works out and goes, well, I can't do anything with those, so I'll just ignore them. So one-to-one -one means it's going to connect neuron one to neuron one, neuron two to neuron two. The neurons have a sort of implicit ID within the population that they are linear. You can identify them later and find out what the voltages are and things like that from that ID. Um, there is an all-to-all -all connector, which means everything on the left connects to everything on the right. And of course, that works with whatever size populations you have. Uh, a fixed probability connector, which I picked a couple of random connections here. Um, so the probability is how likely, uh, for every connection, you, you decide whether or not to connect it with that probability. Um, so in this case, a point 0.1, you might get something like that. With a 0.5 probability, you get more connectivity, and so on and so forth. Um, there's a fixed total number connector, which says connect this num make this number of synapses, but I'm not going to tell you how. Um, this can result in multapses, so you can end up with um, the same neuro two neurons being connected twice. And they might, if you use certain parameters, you might end up with different weights and delays on those two connections. So. That's uh, a useful feature, potentially. We use that in the microcircuit, that the cortical microcircuit model uses fixed total number connectors. Um, and there is a from list connector, which allows you to be extremely explicit of what you want to do. Um, I generally, although there are some things in the tutorial that give you the from list connector, it's a good idea to try and get out the habit of using them if you can. The problem with the from list connector is we have to do it, everything on the host machine and transfer all that data to Spinnaker. It ends up being a lot slower. In the software, the main software that's actually installed on the Jupyter Notebooks, you won't find actually there's much improvement in speed between the two things. But certainly in the Git version, we've now improved things. So using non-from-list connectors will actually be faster <laughs> because it actually generates the connectivity on the machine, whereas from-list connectors has to be done on the host machine transferred to Spinnaker. It's always slower. I'll tell you about them because it's fine. People need to know that they exist, but it's generally advised to avoid them if you can. So yes, down to those synapses. Um, this is a static synapse. It has a weight of 1 and a delay of 2. 2 is the delay are all milliseconds. Everything's in milliseconds. The weight does depend on the, the type of neuron you're using. If you're using a current neuron, it's in nanoamps. If you're using a conductance neuron, it's in micro siemens. <laughs> if that means anything to you, if it doesn't mean anything to you, don't worry too much about it. Basically, a bigger number there will create a bigger connection. So it means it will cause more to happen when the spike is received. Um, and similarly, delays means it, it's like thinking about it, it's like the neuron moves further away. That's not entirely correct in all cases, but that's a good way of thinking of it, potentially. Um, there are limits to our delays on Spinnaker, just to do with the, the I think someone mentioned yesterday, <coughs> if you have 16 time steps, anything more than 16 time steps will require it to insert an extra node into the graph, which causes it to delay. By extra sorry, hops. More than, how many times? 16? then 16 time steps. I didn't write it on the slide, sorry. Yeah. If you, but you can go up to 144 time I steps see. in total by using these extensions. Is that a limitation of the hardware? Is that a limitation of the Sort of a limitation of the hardware. It's to do with the amount of memory we have on each core. Okay, right. We so just, we have to use, storage. the delays are actually done by storage and shifting. So okay. Yeah, exactly. Oh, sorry. One second yep. question. Uh, how can we connect the neurons within the same? Uh, Ah, yeah, you just, if you do your projection, you just say pop one, pop one, and that's oh, okay. self-connected. Yep. And for the synapses, uh, can we also introduce uh, kind of plasticity? 
Yes, I'll get to that in a minute as well. <laughs> in fact, it might be coming up. Now, first of all, I've got random. So yes, again, you can specify the weights and delays as being random distributions. Uh, I've shown you a normal distribution here just for the change. Um, one thing to say on, on delays in particular, it's fairly important you might want to use a clipped because what I said before, you've only got, you might want to stop it from either using delay extensions, which means you don't want to go over 16, or you um, don't want to go over 144 overall because otherwise the system will just go, you told me something I can't do. It's not clever enough, unfortunately, yet to say, oh, I should, should just round those. I mean, it's basically giving you as the user that choice to understand what you're doing. So there is a normal clipped, which I think means it redraws. So it, anything outside, it tries again until it's got something inside the distribution, inside the boundaries of the distribution. Um, there is a normal clip to boundary, which means when it's outside, it just hits the boundary. That is the, it replaces the number with the boundary. So just to know the differences, because of course it creates a different distribution technically. Um, so it's worth knowing that. It probably won't make a lot of difference to what you're running, to be honest. But <laughs> some people, these things matter. So plasticity, I've already asked. We do have plasticity. We have spike time dependence plasticity. Um, for those who don't know what this is, here's a sort of brief introduction. I'm afraid it does get quite complicated, but the, the basics of it are um, the presynaptic neuron sends a spike. This is received at the post-synapse, so it's received at the synapse sort of before the neuron. Um, at some time later, the postsynaptic neuron sends a spike, and there's some sort of backtrace that goes back down towards the synapse. And so that was also received at the other side of the synapse. So it's between the spike from the pre-neuron arriving at the synapse and the spike at the post-neuron back propagating to the synapse. It's not the same as the forward propagation here, <laughs> just to warn you. Um, so basically, we take a time then between those two, and that becomes the time on which we depend. our plasticity depends. How the plasticity depends on that time comes up in a minute. Don't worry too much about it. But basically, it's the point of neuron spikes to show you on this a bit more. So this neuron spikes and it reaches, say, the synapse down here. This neuron spikes, it's sending out somewhere else, but it, it sort of back propagates some voltage to here. So it's, there is a spike that potentially goes out and it could be self-connected or it could connect here, but that's not the one we're talking about. We're talking about the back propagation here. It's a bit of a back propagation delay. Uh, and they're the times we take. You may also have the opposite, of course, where the, the pre-neuron spikes first and it's got its back propagation and the post-neuron um, also spikes. And then we also use that in our plasticity. Um, normally, if the pre-neuron spikes first, um, the you do potentiation. So you raise the weight of the synapse. And if the post-neuron spikes uh, first, you make it a depression, because you say it couldn't have been caused by that. That's the normal way of doing things. That said, if you make your own rule, you can do whatever you want with it. It's not, that's why I don't want to be prescriptive here. That's what normal plasticity rules do. But if you change the plasticity rule, you can do with it what you want. Um, on Spinnaker, the important thing to know is there's a deferred execution model. Um, there's all these spikes going on up here. But actually, until this second spike occurs in the, uh, the um, I think I've got this the wrong way around. It should have been a pre-spike. So until a second spike occurs in the pre-neuron, in fact, you can't actually do the processing. Um, so you actually uh, do the processing in a sort of deferred fashion. Yeah, sorry. I messed up the slide slightly. I'll have to think about that one in the future. Um, it's actually the pre-neuron that we do it on, though. So every time we receive a pre-spike, we try and do the plasticity from the last pre-spike forwards and from um, this pre-spike backwards. Um, and it's, it, you only have to know that so that if you're doing a network with like two spikes in it and you expect some SDP to occur, it won't have happened because you haven't yet received the other spike. So when you're doing SDP, you have to remember to add that extra spike in if you're doing something really simple. Hopefully in a reasonably busy network, this won't be a problem, but in a, in a sort of light, you know, the usual thing is the first thing you're going to be doing is very simple networks and you'll probably spot this very quickly. So okay. I'm hearing you kind of have two spikes per... Neuron. Two pre spikes. Two, two spikes per neuron to have anything happen. To have anything happen, exactly. Exactly. Okay. That's You're the way to think of it. We need to go back. Okay. Yeah, sorry. The third line, <laughs> the, the post spike is the. the I know, I put it, in the wrong, put it in the wrong thing. It should have been up here. Really. 
that's the problem. I just noticed it when I <laughs> now I'm looking at the slide myself going, this is a bit confusing. Yeah, it's not the post spike that causes this, the, the plasticity, it's the pre-spikes. So actually, if you reverse these diagrams and all the pre-spikes are happening, it's th those that, so you need two pre-spikes to get anything to happen. And by post spike, you mean the, the second neuron the spiking. from the yes. going backwards to exactly. the original synapse. Exactly, yeah. Post, so pre is the one before the synapse, post is the one afterwards, yeah. Sorry, uh, probably using technical terms that I don't even know I'm using, so <laughs> please feel free to pick me up on it. Okay, um, so we describe our, as I say, that's, for the, that's the sort of mechanism. We describe the STDP in Pine by just saying there's a timing dependence and a weight dependence. Um, you might set this up with a weight of zero, which kind of says there's a connection here, but nothing's going to happen when a spike happens. Um, and that's fine, that's okay. You can do that sort of thing. Um, and eventually, hopefully, the plasticity will then learn that there's some actual is a connection there um, if you set things up in the right way. Um, there are some rules already in Pine. I'm afraid there's a big load of maths there. Uh, don't worry too much about it. Um, what this basically says is there's a, there's a rule called the spike pair rule. This is the easiest one to understand. So you've got a pair of spikes, you've got a pre and a post spike. If there's a gap between them, I can actually do this with this, can't I? If the, there's a certain time gap between them, you'll get a certain amount of change in your, in your rule. The amount of change will be a bit more determined by the, by the next bit I'll talk about, but this sort of gives you a, a size of change. Um, and similarly, if, there's, if you get the opposite around, there's some depression going on, this, or a spike, well, a spike occurs afterwards, there will be a sort of negative amount of change. So if you've got a, which way around is it, a pre-spike before a post-spike, you'll be in this sort of region here. So it sort of gives you the amount of change that you're going to get based on, on what is actually happening in your network. Uh, again, you don't have to worry too much about the detail there. Um, you then have your weight dependence, which then says, how does it actually change given a certain amount? So given one of those things that came off the other graph, how does my weight actually change now? This is what I meant about plasticity getting quite complicated quite quickly. <laughs> um, when you try these things out, it's much easier to understand. But basically, this is saying this actually has a range, so it says I'm not allowed to change my weight um, outside of this range. So we can have a minimum and a maximum range. Um, but otherwise, this is called an additive weight dependent. So it's basically saying I'm going to just add on an amount based on that amount of change that came from the timing rule. <laughs> this is the problem. They link together in a complicated way. There is a multiplicative weight dependence. <laughs> ah! <laughs> it's now getting really complicated. This one basically just means that the change is now dependent on the current weight at the time. I didn't try to draw the graph because it was horrible. <laughs> it's very difficult to draw a graph of this. Basically, it's just saying that the weight depends now upon, uh, the weight change depends on the current weight as well. So basically, as you get closer to W max or W min, your weight changes are going to get smaller and smaller. That's all that's saying, really. Oops. Let me move on. There it is. So we've created our network. Very complicated. But we now get to the point where we're actually going to run it. So we specify p.run. The time is in milliseconds. That's how long you're going to run your network for. Um, when you do this, there's a few things that the software is going to do. Um, and this can take a reasonable amount of time to do at this point uh, in the software development cycle. So what it'll do is it'll take your populations. If you've made them huge, they might actually get broken down into smaller parts on the machine. Um, you don't need to worry about this mostly, but this is what might happen. And it might not happen on a single chip, instantly. It might happen on multiple chips. It could put them anywhere. Um, it will try and work out the best way. The other thing that will happen is it will try to um, route things across the machine. So it will say, we've got some things on the machine here. We've got some things on the machine here. We need to send spikes out in this way. So it sets up multicast routes so it can work out where they all go. So if we're trying to get from this place to all these places, this will just it will create these special multicast routes. I won't go into the detail of the multicast, but this is kind of how it happens. So when a spike actually is sent here, actually get back, you can see it again. Um, it kind of propagates across the machine like this. It's obviously a lot faster than that. <laughs> happens in, in less than the blink of an eye. Less than a. It happens in within a millisecond guaranteed across the whole machine. That's across the million core machine. But actually, it's quicker than that. I think we've measured it. You could probably do 0.1 millisecond across the whole machine, no problem. Um, the other thing that happens is all these populations will generate some data. So this is all the connectivity data and everything. Initially, that's written to disk. 
and then afterwards that's loaded up onto the machine. So we write all the stuff down, you know, with all the parameters you specified, all your synapses, everything gets written to disk, and then it gets loaded onto the machine. So these processes can be a bit slow. I'm only really telling you about them because you'll see this happening when you're running the, the, the networks. So just to make sure I understand the idea is that we have the architecture and the specification of the individual neurons and synapses. Um, yep. And all the rules thereof yep. are written to disk, typed to Spinnaker, yep. or your favorite other system. Or favorite other system, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Pretty much. Obviously, it depends on the implementation. I guess some other people might be loading bits as they go, but <laughs> that's certainly how we do it, yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, the other thing is you can, once you've actually run and it's finished running, it comes back to you and you can now do other things. You can actually change some of the parameters. You can't change the synapses on the system because that could affect significantly how it's laid out on the machine. But you can change simple things. So like, for example, this is a parameter of um, a lift neuron called I offset, which is the, um, a basic input current. You can change that, and then you can run for a bit longer. So you can see the effect of a change on your network, for example. And that's the good thing about this is I've made this nice and small, because that change doesn't require it to remap the entire system again and reload it again. It just goes <coughs> that one change and start running again. So it's a lot quicker. So um, if I wanted to run an experiment in which is the simplest possible experiment, I build one neuron, Yep. I'm recording from it, Okay. and I provide a step stimulus to it. OK. Would that be? Is there a way to say, I want to, I want to specify a stimulus time, like a, a vector of times? Not currently, no. So, so that is something that's been mentioned, but you can do it with this mechanism. You can say the I offset is zero, run, run it for run a bit. Run 50, I offset zero, run yep. 50, I offset so up. Exactly, okay. run 50, right. yeah, exactly. So we've got a mechanism to do it, but so we haven't prioritized that. that. But there is a, I think Pine does actually have a step current source. We just haven't implemented it so far. Okay. We probably implement it by doing this hidden in the background. So. <laughs> Um, once you've actually finished your simulation, you probably want to get those nice things that you chose to record. Um, obviously, don't specify things here that you didn't say you'd recorded. You can. It'll probably just give you an error. Um, but yeah, you get the data. That can take a reasonable amount of time, because this is something we definitely just have to drag off the machine. It's been recorded on the machine during the simulation. We drag it off at this point. Move on. This data is quite complicated in how it's formatted. <laughs> it's in a format called Neo. Neo consists of blocks. Blocks contain segments. There's almost always a segment. There will be a segment zero. Um, and probably for all the things you're doing, there'll only be a segment zero, so don't worry too much about it. Um, each of those segments then contains spike trains and analog signal arrays. Spike trains are obviously the spikes. Analog signal arrays are then your V that you recorded, probably in this case, as I've described it so far. There are other things you can record in theory. I haven't gone into detail here. Um, they'll probably, almost everything that other than spikes will come out as an analog signal array. To give you a bit more of a hint, because that's obviously horrible. <laughs> um, you can get your V a bit like this. We've got our analog signal arrays, and you can get your spikes, if any of the thing will go away in a second. <laughs> Thinking about it, there it goes. You can get your spikes like the thing at the bottom. Um, that'll give you your spike trains. And it's giving you one for every, um, one spike train for every neuron, of course, one analog signal array for every neuron if you recorded it. If you don't record those, of course, those don't con it doesn't contain those parts. There's only the things that you recorded that come out. And you can then plot them. And matplotlib is one way of doing this, nice and simple. Um, this will plot our voltages, voltage times against voltage. You can actually just specify V0 as well, and it will probably come out with a reasonable answer, especially at one millisecond time steps. It basically, if you do it at 0.1 millisecond time steps with just V0, these numbers at the bottom won't match up to your proper times, that's all. Um, there is actually, oh yeah, you can plot your spikes in a very similar way. The spikes, you would have to, um, basically you're plotting them against the actual spike ID, so you may need to generate something a bit like this to sort of get an ID out of the system. It's a bit fiddly. Luckily, Pine actually gives you some things that make it a little bit easier. So actually, the Pine has these um, plotting things. So if you want to do fairly simple, just V plotting and spike plotting, you can do something with this figure and this panel object up here. Um, so you say there's a figure and it contains two panels, um, and you can see that's what comes out at the end. So it's not too complicated. It doesn't actually have any times on there, I noticed, but you can you can configure these things a bit more. Uh, it's worth seeing the Python documentation to see how, but for most things you can see what's going on there. So it's good enough. You can see voltage reached a peak got a spike, voltage reach peak, got a spike. So 
makes some sense. I suspect this was done over a large time scale, which is why there isn't much obvious refractory period there. Um, one thing to say, if you're using your Jupyter notebook, I've spotted sometimes you get this when you do your, plip, your panel. So you think, oh, that's odd. It isn't showing me my figure. Why not? If you actually just click this button again, <laughs> it sorts itself out, and it displays your figure. So <laughs> just a weird thing in Jupyter, not worked out why. It does it sometimes, sometimes it doesn't. Try it out, see what you get. So if you've done some plasticity, you may also want to get your weights and delays at the end of simulation. You can do so. Um, you can specify weight and delay there. You can specify just one of them if you're not interested in delays. Um, when you say this is a list format, so basically it gives you the pre and post neuron IDs as well, automatically. There is a way to turn that off, but you probably don't want to. It's quite useful to know which one was which. Uh, so this is basically which neuron, pre neuron, and which post neuron. As I say, they're just IDs. <coughs> they do mean something internally. So you could work out if there was a connection, there was also a spike. Yay. That obviously made sense. Um, you can get them as an array as well, which is then doesn't include the the source and target. You can you can specify an array here, but all it does is return you an array of these arrays. So it's easier just to say, okay, let's just get the weight um, or the delays. Don't do both at the same time potentially. Uh, and yeah, it just gives you an array where there aren't actual connections made. So this was done with a fixed probability connector, I think. Um, you just get these nans in place, so it's not a numbers. Um, there is more Pine documentation. Um, if you want to have a look at that, that is where it is. You can probably just type Pine into Google and it will almost certainly come up without bothering to follow that link. Um, is there more? Okay. I don't have more in the way of slides. So, let me go back to the slide here in case people have missed it. Um, that is where the Jupyter Notebook is. There is in the Jupyter Notebook, let me actually see if I can see it with mine. I'll just use a local login today. Thinking about it. There is within there a folder called Running Pine Simulations. And within that folder, there are various tasks. There's also a Running Pine Simulation um, notebook itself, which has some of the code that I've talked about in there. Um, there's various more a little bit more detail potentially on different things in there. At the very bottom, it actually links to those same exercises, so um, you can try things out. And I think the idea now is to uh, have a go with that sort of stuff and see where you get on. And you can give us a shout if you need help with it, really. So, um, let's see. I'll put it back to the uh, URL again. There you go. Now you guys mentioned that you were looking at constraint satisfaction problems. Yep. Um, do you have any of that code online? Ooh, almost certainly. Uh, question is where? <laughs> yeah, be, I mean, we don't have to do it today, but that's okay. definitely the kind of thing where um, that's one of my end goals with this, is to actually look at how you guys are handling that problem and okay. just sort of run some of those. I mean, I can give you a sort of idea of what was doing is in the Sudoku example, you set up squares of the numbers. So you set up the numbers as single groups of, groups of neurons, potentially for each number. Okay. And then you've got rows, columns, squares. <coughs> and you basically say, you inhibit, you put inhibitory connections between things that can't happen. So you say, this should never, you should never have the same number in a square. So each neuron here that says, if it's zero, inhibit all the ones, all the twos, all the threes, all the fours, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, uh, nine, sorry, <laughs> right. and keep going round. And all of those, there's loads and loads of inhibitory connections. So basically, you can describe all the constraints pretty much as inhibition in this case. Um, okay, I see how that works. I think yep. I see how that works for Sudoku. Uh, of course, it may not work in all problems, yeah. Right. So that's right. kind of, a, that's kind of a, the basics of that. Of course, the other thing you then have to realize is you've done that, but all you've got in your network now is inhibition, <laughs> which means there's nothing making it do anything at all. <coughs> so what you then do is feed it with a certain amount of background noise. Yeah. And I suspect Steve can probably tell more detail about <laughs> this because he did the Sudoku network originally, didn't you? It's to do with the amount of background noise is fairly critical and to how well the network actually performs at that point, isn't it? I think, as in how much... Yes, I mean, Gabriel took his lot yeah, of course. Um, in, in, the, in the published paper. Ah. I, I just use constant noise. Yes, 
and that's I think the, the examples that we do have done that. The noise in bursts. But you said the magic word, there's a published paper, so I wasn't sure if it was work in progress or if it had been Ah, published. okay, yes. So no, the, the, um, there's a Frontiers paper on, on, on I guess if you, s if you search for spinnaker and constraint satisfaction problems, I, mean, I, can, I can give yeah. you a Gabriel. Gabriel. <laughs> that's no problem. Um, yeah. Let's say that, let's, do you guys typically include your code with your, like your, your setup code with your papers, or is that something we can ask you guys for? You can certainly ask us for it. We're not precious about it generally, are we? I right. mean, there's, there's, I guess the Sudoku, we'll probably have to get it from Gabriel. It, it yeah, I mean, I, 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 I presumably have the ori my original Sudoku. I've probably here, got it somewhere. Which is, which is quite <laughs> simple, which is, yep. I mean, the, 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 uh, the Sudoku Pine description is about 150 lines of Python. Wonderful. And then there's the post analysis, which is a similar size. And that the post analysis does things like generate the video. Yes. <laughs> yeah, no, that's wonderful. I mean, I think that that's a really, I, I hadn't, uh, I, I wasn't aware that you guys had started doing the constraint satisfaction stuff, so that's really cool. Yeah. Thanks. It's interesting. There's, there's one of the things, of course, it doesn't do is stop. I think someone mentioned this yesterday, if I remember rightly. Uh, I, either in a talk or I was talking to someone, I can't remember which. But basically, it just, it runs on, it carries on. It doesn't know it's solved the problem. It has no way of knowing right. that. So it just goes, and oft often, because the noise is still going, it might upset one of these positions and suddenly go, and suddenly forget that it solved the problem and start solving it again, right. <laughs> or solve a different problem. The other one I've seen is that it gets so excited in, in some places that it causes, why well, you've tried to fix the number, because you, you fix the number with a higher rate Poisson, so you're just firing, hammering it with spikes, so it goes, I'm fixed number. But actually, if the network gets excited enough, it'll override that, and then it'll just cheat. And it'll solve an entirely different Sudoku problem. <laughs> <laughs> and I've seen it do that. Right. And then Steve's other one was fun, which is if you don't set any numbers to a fixed thing, and you can set the noise to a certain level, it'll come up with its own Sudoku problem and solve it. Oh. <laughs> yeah, no, these are, these are interesting. They're quite uh, fun, fun states and things that it goes Yeah, because I think that the... Um, my interest is in comparing performance of neuromorphic hardware with the quantum annealers. Okay. Um, yes. Okay. So we're, we're looking at that. I guess it sort of potentially goes in the same sort of way. And in fact, I think there was a time when we played with the Poisson noise so that it would go down over time, like it was annealing in a way. Yeah. I don't think it did ended up working very well, did it? Or I think I remember you did something with it. Yeah. Again, Gabrielle may have done it differently. Right. I don't know. Well, I'll, I'll read the paper. Yeah, of course. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, I, mean, I know Gabrielle's found the most effective approach was to actually send the noise in in bursts. Ah, okay. <coughs> and so, so basically, knock it with a hammer every so often. Yes. Okay. Just to wake it up. Yeah. Do some more. Do some more. That's a good idea. So, what level of complexity uh, in terms of the single neural models is going to be the model? Well. Uh, Conceptually, it was intended for point neural models, okay? Um, and the ones we had in mind at the time were leaky integrated file and dizzy cabbage. Yep. Um, um, but it's, the model is software, so you can clearly add complexity, add richness to the model up to a point. There comes a point where this becomes silly. So if what you want to do is model highly biologically detailed neurons in a similar way to Henry Markham's blue brain, Cell paper, then Spinnaker is definitely not the right machine uh, for that game. You need a you know, double precision float supercomputer um, to play those sorts of games. But we we are looking at things such as two compartment pyramidal cells, where you have the, where you separate the effects of the apical and basic the dendrite dendritic inputs and try and model the interaction because mm -hmm. the pyramidal cells do seem to have those two. Level thing. And also, of course, um, there's a lot of interest in, in, in viewing individual dendritic branches as local nonlinear processes as well. Now, that's probably pushing what we can do a bit hard. We we'll probably do that, we thought about it a bit, we haven't done it. We we'll probably do that by effectively treating each dendritic process as a kind of atom, so like a neuron in its own right, uh, and then link them together using. So th those kind of things seem seem possible, if not trivial. <coughs> there was a paper of them doing something like that on brain scales, wasn't there? So I think presumably yeah. we could do the same. Brain scales has done the two compartment pyramidal cell in their analog system. Um, the other thing, the other, the other interesting question, I think I mentioned this in, in the workshop, is, is you know, 
how accurate you want the new metrics. And, and for, for sort of our personal research, my, my view is the brain's fairly noisy, so you know, 64-bit numerical precision seems a bit irrelevant. On the other hand, a lot of our users are running their models on 64-bit flow systems and expect to get the same answers out of Spinnaker. Yep. So, so there's a kind of pressure from the users to, to, for us to at least be able to offer high precision numerics. And uh, so the differential equation solvers, I think we, we currently use RK2, don't we? Four, Zikovic, I think. So Obviously, Lif is. Or is it RK4? No, RK2. RK2. Dave's done some RK4 stuff, but I don't think. Yeah, so a lot of the there. earlier computational neuroscience model at the point neuron levels use simple forward Euler integration. But actually, that's pretty in, pretty inaccurate for uh, Izzy Kavich, for instance, which is quite stiff at the spike point. Um, now, you know, if you, if you think accuracy doesn't matter, then you don't care about that, right? But, but if, if, um, if you. Because all these equations are just approximations to some reality. I mean, no, no equation is, it, is exactly capturing everything in biology. So they're all approximations. So it doesn't matter if the solution is a bit approximate too. But um, things like RK2 have made a huge difference. And, and in fact, we're, we haven't integrated this into the software yet. But we're about to produce a paper on yet another step forward in numerical precision. Again, I mentioned this based, based on the use of stochastic rounding. And, we, and what we can show is that fixed point arithmetic with stochastic rounding is actually more accurate than single precision flow. It's not more accurate than double precision flow, but it's, it's, it's somewhere fairly close to double Pro precision. Provided you're doing the right thing, presumably. Hmm? Provided you're doing the right thing is the, always the trick. As in, as long as you're doing lots of things. <laughs> oh, yes, you've got well, It's got to be right, statistical. You've got to have the scaling about right. Yeah. Um, but the. Uh, but yeah, I can see so why. We, we, we've, we've put quite a lot of work into numerical precision, and some of that is in standard tools. Yeah. So they are using RK2 integration, which is pretty good for these problems. If you, again, if you want more precision, you do need to go to point 0.1 millisecond time step. But at the moment, yep. that requires you slow the modeling down. But we've got other developments, which yep. may mean we can actually run point 0.1 millisecond in real time. But that's not in. Not in the tools that you're accessing. No, no, no. Not even in the Git version. So don't no, get excited. That's, that's, that's still a work in progress. Um, Our plan is to get the microcircuit model harnessed to 0.1 millisecond real time. Um, we're currently doing it about 20 times slow down. It's 0.1 millisecond, that's how it runs. But we had to do 20. We discovered actually 10 of that 20, as in, so, yeah, so we can go to 10 times slow down by just removing a crazy bit of behavior that start at the start of the simulation. So at the start of the simulation, it sets, remember the V initialize I was talking about, it sets half of them above threshold as part of its model. So there's this massive burst of spikes at the start, of course, because the whole thing goes, oh, they're all above threshold, spike, spike, spike. So you just get this wave of spikes at the very start, and it upsets everything. Everything gets out of sync. Um, so we had to go to 20 times slow down to counter that. But at one of our, um, one of our RAs has discovered that actually you don't need to do it if you just change that behavior at the start. You can now get away with 10 times slow down. But it doesn't seem we can get faster than 10 with the current software. So we have to do changes then to the actual implementation of the neural models to get better than that. Uh, but we're looking at it, yeah. That's the, the trick with Spinnaker is it's all software. So you can do almost an infinite number of different things. <laughs> it's just us finding out the focus of what we should be concentrating Yes, I mean, every, everything on the machine is extremely soft, including the routing. And yes. So on. And <coughs> the good side is this means you can keep improving things. The, bad, the downside is the search space is infinite. Yes. <laughs> the downside is you can keep improving things. <laughs> we don't know when we're ever done. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, exactly. So um, are people getting on with? People managing to log on. Oh, I can see, I can see a yep. graph here. So that's oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> the Sunfire example works fine. Hey. I have actually got solutions. Uh, I should probably not tell you. In the folder, there is a solutions yes. folder. <laughs> no, <that's what> <laughs> Those who <laughs> might know may have already found it. So. Yeah. That should make it easier if you do find there's trouble. But at the same time, yeah, feel free to ask or <laughs> try not to look at the solution. <laughs> I've tried to kind of guide you through it with the, the actual examples, so they're step by step more than they are just do this 
uh, again, if you want to, in the, the bottom of the tutorial, it kind of describes the um, example without actually going into it. So if you want to set yourself a challenge and try it without my help, then uh, feel free to do so. See if you can work all that out. Uh, I got a role that says that pop is not deployed. <laughs> <laughs> it's maybe fun, fun of Jupyter Notebooks here, of course. <laughs> <laughs> Initialize. So, ah, is that because you're running? Oh, yeah, okay. If you run the things in the Pine simulations on running Pine simulations on Spinnaker, they were just really code examples, so they're probably not going to work in themselves. So the actual example, if you go down to the bottom of this, it gives you the actual tasks that you can do. Um, yeah, they're just. Uh, other bits are just code the exercises exactly, and you can try those things instead. Um, so yeah, if you, that loads up in the new, and then you can actually do. You have to actually, I'm afraid, fill in the blanks. <laughs> like I said, there is some there is some uh, pre-done um, solutions if you want to, but if you want to try to fill in the blanks, the idea was to try and get you to learn it. So <laughs> that was the hope anyway. Understanding something, but it doesn't look like you're actually setting weights on like the full connection matrix. Oh, okay, so when around. you say the the static synapse bit, yeah, and that has the weight. You just specify a single number. That's yeah, yeah. actually just repeated for all the different connections in that case. If it's a single oh, number, okay. Now so you can use the random distribution. You can actually right. provide it with a list but it's fiddly because you have to get the right number. If it's a all-to-all -all connector, it's quite easy. You can work out how long that list is, and same with one-to-one. -one. Right. Of course, if it's a fixed probability connector, you don't know what it's <laughs> going to come up with, so you can provide it with a list, but you might not get it right. <laughs> I see. Okay. It's very difficult. It's easier if, not to do that. If you do a fixed probability connector, you've already got some stochasticity. In the yes. Connectors. Anyway, you may as well use a random weight distribution. To yeah, exactly. Right. That's, okay. that's and, usually and how people do it. And that, of course, is very efficient because all of that is expanded on the machine. Yeah, is that now not in, in that version that you're using, I'm afraid, unfortunately. But I was hoping people wouldn't get too big at this point with their networks. If you do go very large with the network, you might find it runs slow. It should still run. You can always try the Git version to see if it's better. Um, scaling up on Spinnaker is trivial because you have you say, oh, I've created a network with 100 neurons. In. Let's just put 1,000 in there. It's really easy, you know. Let's just put a million in there. <laughs> it doesn't stop you. Um, okay. I've no idea what will happen on the. <laughs> On the machine, if you try it, <laughs> feel free. Feel free to break things. Yeah, don't worry. If it breaks, we'll reset things. And <laughs> that way, we'll know where the where the problems are. Okay. Yep. How about, how about a hint? Mm -hmm. um, I want to make a pop this is a stimulation population. Yep. Um, I understand the popul the p dot population yep. parameter there. How do I pass in what? What type it is. So it's similar to the ifca rex previously. You just do p dot spike source array or spike source plus. Yeah. yeah. Just replace that bit. Yes, the kind of neuron model of the, the population is what you're describing. Right. So is anybody still struggling with getting connected? Could you say where the pine, like, where do I find The pine? Uh, yep. Yeah. Have a look again. Where have we got it? You tried to do this on the phone. No, my, my laptop. There you go. <laughs> Can you see that? <laughs> yeah. But it's fine. No problems. I'm here just for the day. So. As I say, I don't guarantee that everything in Pine will work on Spinnaker. That's the only thing I would say. Oh, but it's, yeah, it's, it's yeah, it gives you the, the full detail. Things. Yeah, yeah. If it fails for some reason, ask. But it might be I'll come to you and say, oh, sorry, we don't support that. <laughs> Unfortunately. Yeah, it should, I mean, it should work. Yeah, you, you, it's a good documentation. You take the details away. So. Yeah. Yeah, it probably will work on a phone. Oh. <laughs> no look. It does work on a phone, actually. Yeah, I've tried it. It's, it's fiddly. I've done it in places where it's, yeah. you know. <laughs> it's just the typing is not horrible. Yeah, 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 exactly. It's the keyboard interface. That's true. That is true. So is everybody else basically up and running? <laughs> Good. Look at that. It's nice and easy. Yeah. Somehow I managed to get through my, my log on problem as well. I just OK. What, did you still log in with HPP or did you have to sign up in the end? Well, I started again at the beginning. Okay. And then I didn't have to put my password in because it already thought I was logged on to HPP and it just connected me through. So. Okay. Fair enough. My magic. 
this, the, the HPP login is fairly magic in itself. So yeah, some of the things, that's probably ways that I've not worked out yet that it can go wrong. Yeah. Uh, but it's not too bad. <laughs> I guess look over someone's shoulder or... <laughs> Actual time it is. I've got the different times on different devices now. Ten fourteen. So, what time were we supposed to be? Eleven. Ooh, yep. <laughs> so this is uh, actually. So this comes from my back of the uh, background. Yeah, so that's okay. So when you say uh, there's no clock in the system, there so is really. There's a there is a time step, and things are kind of happening on that time step really. So the neuron the neuron state is updated on the time step. And if it reaches threshold, then it sends a spike at that time step, and that goes across to the other neurons. Technically, there is there is synchronization between the cores because they all run on a. If, if you're on a single board, there's a single clock that runs across the board, and that keeps everything in sync. However, as you get the network bigger and bigger, that won't become true anymore. It'll disappear. You won't actually have a um, clock that you can guarantee. So, the kind of the way they say it is time time models itself. So. You know, if a spike happens to go in the wrong time step, hopefully your network is robust enough that it doesn't matter. <laughs> so there, there, is an there is a sort of clock in this basis, yeah, yeah. You can do these simulations without, with less clocking, and you know, you can say, well, it just, when a spike arrives, it has a certain sort of time in it. In a way, it's still got a time, though, so it's got a time stamp, and you then have to adjust your, you know, you start doing your neural processing based on those spikes that arrive. It's uh, more complicated. We've not got that yet. <laughs> and I know that the, you have mentioned a problem you will show uh, this uh, session. Uh, when you connect this connector to any other device to control yes. whatsoever, so it's based on uh, this kind of synchronization is in clock or um, not overly. I mean, so we certainly the devices obviously are just they don't know what time is, so they just tend to be updating. Um, based on what they receive immediately. I suppose the fact that we're running in real time means that the reaction time of the device will be in real time as well. So I suppose the example is you've got your robot and it's on the desk and it's got an edge detector so it knows when it's going to reach the edge of the desk. So it's constantly sending signals into the neural network. Now if the ne as the network is running, if it was running slow, it wouldn't necessarily send the signal back to the robot before it fell off the desk, but if you can keep it in synchrony real time approximately, then it will probably catch and go, Ooh, edge, stop. Um, the way we've done the integration, I haven't covered it in this uh, system, but we do have, we've got stuff online about it as well. Um, the way we kind of do the integration is we tend to send a signal, like control signals to the robot. So the robot has a retina feed, and that turns into spikes. So it's the DBS cameras that you've probably seen over the system. That sends into the network. You do whatever it is you do with your network to get the response out. Then you have a control, um, which is another binary that runs on the system, and that actually converts spikes that it receives into commands. So it goes, ah, okay, we've received a motor left spike. Let's send a motor left to the robot, and that goes back out. It's still a multicast packet, but it goes out out of a natural interface, and then the robot uses that to, to control itself. Um, there are some. There is an interface for the pushbot, for example, that actually can theoretically receive spikes and do its own processing to work out whether it's left, right, or whatever, but we've tended not to bother. It tends to end up being so complicated that it's easier to, you've got more control if it's on the Swinnaker side, so we can change the binary. <laughs> it's harder to reprogram the robots, actually, so, yeah, yeah, that tends to be it. I think on Spinnaker 2, we're planning on having more um, normalized interfaces, so things that you would normally expect to find, like USB sort of interfaces, maybe not USB, but something of that sort of nature, or a UART actually on the the device itself, so it's possible to plug in directly your robot. That's the plan so far. So <laughs> don't hold me to it. Sorry, the expected time. Expected time for Spinnaker two. Um, it depends, I think, on funding and everything, doesn't it? Um, we're currently we've done the first chip tape out the, the initial version, not Spinnaker two, but a a part of Spinnaker two, so we can do some testing. Um, SGA3 of HPP, which is in about a year's time, I guess it must start, is the point where we're supposed to do have the next chip, um, the actual Spinnaker 2 chip ready 
for actually getting boards and everything like that, obviously it takes a bit of time, so that'll be over time. The question of, as I say, that comes down to funding so far. It's not guaranteed at this point, so we're in negotiations. If you have a desire for it, then <laughs> you need to speak to HVP and say, look, you, want, you should really fund this spinnaker T thing. Yeah. Can we make multiple connections between the same pair of neurons? You can. Okay, so if I, if I, run, a, if I run a block of code, then add another block of code, and they both have connections, it's going to yep. double up on the first one. Yes. Okay. Yeah, yes, and of course, yeah. Jupiter being Jupiter might mean that you might not know you've done it as well. Right. Exactly. <laughs> um, and when you talk about units for the um, for weights, yep. the default unit is in... It's nanoamps if you're using lifcur if cur x. Okay, so it's already in nanoamps. Yeah, it's already nanoamps, yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's the norm, the normally expected units. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Oh, I have a question. Is it fair to plot the graph of the network? Of the network itself. Um. Do you have sanitary connections? Not obviously. Um, Woo. Yeah, I don't, we haven't actually done it. I mean, you could do it. Sorry, the. Ah, okay. You can actually see what it looks like. Yeah, no, we've not actually. There's not something in Pine specifically. Of course, you can get the connectivity um, by the get from from a projection. You can say, get me the actual connectivity between neurons, and then plot that if you wanted to. But it's not a default thing. It'd take a bit of work, I think. <laughs> not something that we currently support. Yeah, never really thought about it. I think. There is something when you run the system. Oh, let me see if I've got an example of this. I, I think you know, this CNRS are developing a, yeah. a Pine GUI front end. I haven't really they are, tried aren't they? To use Pine. Yeah. It'll allow you to d define the network graphically. Um, yes. Yeah. I was going to say when you when you actually run this. I wonder if I've got it on here. Actually, I might be able to show you. Whenever you make actually do a run, I've probably got it in the solutions because I've been running them. Um, there is actually a reports folder that comes out at the end as well. Now it's not graphical, it's all textual, so it will show you the last up to ten runs, I think, of, of things that you've done. Um, and inside there you can find out a little bit more information. I think there is a network specification report, it's just a text file, so um, it kind of says, you know, how did your network connect together, but admittedly it's not super detailed, so it's not like saying the sub-neuron connectivity or anything like that. That's all we have currently. Um, it, there's a lot of other information in there. If you want to know fun things about how Spinnaker is doing its its work, you can kind of have a look around. Say, oh look, there's how it's partitioned up your vertices, um, how the actual multicast keys have been assigned, things of that sort of nature. So yeah, there's a few things like that in there. Yeah. Uh, 